started now. Welcome, friends. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our program, uh, Ukraine, Russia, and NATO Update with Ray McGovern. Uh, tonight's program is sponsored by Massachusetts Peace Action and C the Community Church of Boston. So before we begin, uh, we're going to hear a few words from our sponsors. First up is Cole Harrison, uh, Executive Director of Massachusetts Peace Action. <coughs> Uh, thanks, Amara. Maybe we, should we spotlight? Um, <clears throat> I, I'll just mention a few things. Uh, this weekend is the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And nationwide, there will be actions called Defuse Nuclear War at congressional offices, calling on Congress to rise to the occasion and establish a no first use policy, take our weapons off alert, stop building new ones, and sign the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And we'll have six actions in Massachusetts at congressional offices. And I think there's 50 nationwide. You can go to defusenuclearwar.org for more. Um, we have a webinar on the Taiwan Policy Act with Code Pink on Tuesday. Uh, this is a major change in US policy towards Taiwan and China that we need to understand and act on. Uh, we uh, <coughs> have started a monthly series of standouts on Cuba to end the embargo. And on the 30th of this month, we'll have two standouts in Somerville and in Arlington, Massachusetts at 2 p.m. So welcome you to join those. And finally, for the November 8th election, we are supporting two referendum questions in Massachusetts, the fair share tax and the um, rights of immigrants to get a driver's license. And we're also helping our National Peace Action Network with two candidates who are running in against uh, right-wing Republicans uh, in other states, Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, that's it, back to you, Amar. Great, thanks, Cole. So next up, we're going to pass it to uh, Dean Stevens, the interim administrator and the music director of community, the Community Church of Boston. Hello, folks. You forgot, uh, Amar, to, to mention also the, the fake minister. That's my favorite one. Um, uh, welcome to Community Church. Uh, we are just so honored to be doing these co-sponsorship and so happy to have Amar Ahmad uh, on our team, helping us with all kinds of uh, computer stuff uh, like social networks and, and online things like webinars and co-sponsorships with Mass Peace Action. And I hope we have a whole lot more. We are a beehive of activity right now. You can see behind that we have an incredible gallery display of um, Diane Esmond's postmodernist um, paintings. Um, and this is a whole weekend of activities around that uh, talks. And especially, I will put the link up about this, a concert tomorrow night featuring Stan Strickland and Josh Rosen. Um, I hope you will join us all proceeds uh, of the painting sales as well as of the concert are for our ongoing um, maintenance and improvement projects uh, for this building. Um, we have on Sunday, John Pilger joining us. Uh, we are going to show uh, an excerpt of his film that's called The Coming War on China, and, and then have a Q&A with John. Um, Monday, we have another program about Hebron. It's a, a collaboration with the Tree of Life Foundation in Connecticut. And we have uh, three speakers, uh, Palestinians from the city, town of Hebron. And um, if you don't know about what's going on there, it would behoove you to find out and act to stop the, the, the horrific circumstance there. Um, that's, that's Monday. Um, check out our website, communitychurchofboston.org for a whole bunch of more upcoming events. We have a newsletter that just came out as well. You can find it on our website. Thank you, Amar, and I'm looking forward to hearing you, Ray. Great, thank you, Dean, and uh, thanks to MAPA and Community Church of Boston. Uh, so without further ado, we can get started with our program now. Um, Russia, Ukraine, and NATO update with Ray McGovern. This is a very serious topic, and I know many of us have uh, thought a lot about this. 
uh, for a long time. Uh, some of us have uh, even written about it and read about it. Uh, so I, I just wanna take a second to acknowledge that uh, this is a difficult topic. So thank you everyone for uh, your deep thoughts about this and, and for your time for joining us tonight. We're so grateful uh, and honored really to be uh, joined tonight by uh, Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst Ray McGovern. Uh, Ray McGovern conducted the early morning briefings of the president's daily brief to President Reagan's most senior national security advisors. Earlier, he led the Soviet foreign policy branch and shared national intelligence estimates and other interagency efforts. After he retired, Ray co-created uh, the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity as a corrective to the fraud that had overtaken intelligence analysis, most blatantly before the invasion of Iraq. Uh, Ray McGovern, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Good, got it. Thanks for having me. The, the honor is all mine. Uh, when I look at the schedule of things that are happening with this collaboration of the forces between church and, and uh, uh, peace activists, uh, I'm really, really honored to be part of this discussion. Now, Cole mentioned that today is, or to this month is the uh, 60th, 6 0 uh, anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. It happens that today, the 13th of October, it was the day that the U-2 flew out of the U.S. and photographed uh, the uh, arrival of Soviet medium-range ballistic missiles in Cuba. Uh, they were interpreted, those photos, and given to President Kennedy on the night of the 15th of October. So this is a peculiar uh, kind of an interesting uh, coincidence, and I would simply say, uh, that we are now in a crisis akin uh, to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that is because, uh, well, uh, a great power feels an existential threat. And when a great power feels an existential threat and has the power and wherewithal to meet that threat, that great power does so. Now, in 62, the great power was the United States. Our president was President Kennedy. He made it quite clear that he was not going to abide the entrance of uh, medium range ballistic missiles in Cuba. Uh, the warning time that they would have given would have been in, in, in minutes, a very, very short warning time. And the range would have included Washington, D.C. and Omaha, Nebraska, where SAC, Strategic Air Command, offices were then. So what am I doing here? Am I doing some sort of analysis with Ukraine or what's going on? Well, I will argue, as you'll see in the following, uh, that uh, Putin decided years ago that unless the US stopped putting medium range ballistic missile emplacements ready to accommodate the missiles themselves in Romania, Poland, and Ukraine, then that would be an existential threat to him. And so this, this is a curious kind of uh, uh, anniversary where we remember what great powers do when they're faced with an existential threat. Actually, they do things that are of question legality, like, uh, well, Kennedy put in a blockade. That's an act of war. Uh, he threatened nuclear war. Not supposed to do that. He prepared some of my colleagues that were from the infantry school at Fort Benning to invade Cuba. They're not supposed to do that either, but that's what you do. Now, what did Putin do? Well, we can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, I wanna set the stage because this is very serious stuff. I wanna set the stage for Ukraine by showing you a video by a person I very much admire. His name is Senator Bill Bradley. And I admire him not only because he's a far better basketball player than I was, <laughs> and they beat us when I was playing for Fordham. I admire him very much because he let, he, he let his heart out. Uh, and at the end of January, 2008, when it 
when it appeared that Bush and Cheney were about to persuade NATO allies to admit Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. Uh, Amar, if we could have that first video, uh, that would be really great. And then we can discuss what it's all about. Okay, sure. Russia, <clears throat> this is a this is a terribly sad uh, thing for me because I spent a lot of time in the '80s and early '90s on Russia. I go there every year. I spend weeks there. I travel all over. I got to know most of the people who ran the government and who are now there. And um, I think that. <clears throat> Right now, we're confronted with something that potentially could have been avoided. And the fundamental blunder that the United States made in um, the uh, mid 80s, late, late 80s, early 90s, was the expansion of NATO. I mean, uh, here we'd won the Cold War. We'd won the Cold War. And you um, then had people saying, well, now what are we going to do with NATO? Oh, well, I don't know. It's a bureaucracy. It works. What are we going to do with it? And so then the idea of expanding NATO. And the problem with it is, the, is this. During the negotiation for the reunification of Germany, Gorbachev and Jim Baker, Jim Baker says to Gorbachev, you know, in the treaty, it says, you know, no NATO troops in what was in East Germany. In the discussions, and I had this conversation with Gorbachev last summer, he told me very directly, conversation with Jim Baker, the question was, Baker saying, NATO, if you agree to reunification of Germany in NATO, uh, no expand, NATO will not expand one inch further east, which is what I went to see Gorbachev to confirm, because I care so much about this. Is this true? Now, the interpretation on the American side, Scowcroft says, well, he misinterpreted. Baker, I can't have him quite pinned down. But Gorbachev says very specifically, he said, if you expand one inch for the, if you allow reunification, Germany and NATO, NATO will not expand one inch for the East. And then Gorbachev told me, Cole told him the same thing, which was new information, right? So the first Bush, keeps his promise, assume it's a promise. We talk about partnership for peace and you know, yes. Russians kind of like that idea. And then Clinton comes in, what's the early thing he does in his first term? He expands NATO. Why expand NATO? And I read, the, and I've been rereading because I've been thinking of writing something about this, Strobe Talbot's article in Foreign Affairs about why expand NATO and you read it and you say, huh, that's a reason? You know, and last summer again, I'm talking to a number of people that I've known for many years, two guys who ran for president in Russia in 1996 and 2000. And um, you know, one of them says to me, I'm out campaigning in the Urals. Somebody comes up to me and says, this is 96. Why, why are the Americans expanding NATO? Isn't that military alliance? And they said, well, yeah, but it's, it's a military alliance. And the guy said, the politicians said, Russians might not be able to understand puts and calls, but they certainly understand tanks, right? And think of it this way. What would any politics 101, somebody who's a friend, supporter, goes bankrupt, what do you do? You call them up on the phone and say, you know, Joe, it's tough. I know you, things are going to be OK. You're going to be back. You, know, you show them some respect. And what did we do? We kicked them when they were down. We expanded NATO. And in expanding NATO created the issue that allows the authoritarianism that has returned to say it was justified. And I think that it was a blunder of monumental proportions. 
when I was at Oxford, I spent a lot of time on the origins of the Cold War. And, you know, I read all these documents. I mean, the, all of the documents. And it's, uh, you know, the Russians were responsible, basically. You know, here, it's uh, unfortunate. It's a blunder of vision. And in the best of circumstances, it was bureaucratic inertia in NATO that people had to have a job. In the worst of circumstances, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy with certain people in the Clinton administration who, who were irredentist East European uh, uh, types who believe Russia will forever be the enemy and therefore we got to protect against the time where they might once again be aggressive, thereby creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what do you do with it now? Still have, still talk. But if we had done that, and if we'd really done a strategic partnership, talking about common threats over the long term and what we can do together, because we knew ultimately Russia would be back. I mean, they did have oil even then. Uh, you know, imagine how Iran would be different today. Imagine how Central Asia would be different, you know? So you've got me at a kind of moment where my feelings about the Russian thing are extremely sad because I, I think that we've created a problem that could have been easily avoided. And we, we've lost a partner that could have been enormously important over the long term. And in particular, you know, it, with regard to the issues that most threaten us today. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. You can, okay. Um, I find that very poignant. Uh, Bradley was a good man, he was an honest man. Uh, Scowcroft, less so. Uh, I can cite chapter and verse about that with respect to Iran-Contra and everything else. But uh, let me just pass along a very short vignette. I had a personal experience with one of the chief advisors uh, to Gorbachev. Uh, his name was Kuvaldin. He became a professor at Moscow University. I was there about six or seven years ago in Moscow, and uh, we had a cocktail party, and, and I talked to Kuvaldin, and I asked him, why was that, why was that promise? Uh, the one that... Uh, Jim Baker made, why was it not written down? And he looked at me and he said, Mr. McGovern, first of all, the Germans hadn't bought in yet. It had to do with Germany after all. We had to have their buy-in. And secondly, the Warsaw Pact still existed. That was a problem. But he said, Mr. McGovern, the real reason was we trusted you. No trust now. Let's uh, continue on from what Bill Bradley addressed onto how things worked out with respect to Ukraine in the aftermath. Um, may I have the, uh, the slide equivalence, Amar? Uh, yeah. One second. Whoops, I don't think that's it. It's the one I sent you. Well, that's all right. We'll, we'll uh, boil it down. Do you have a shorter version? Uh, th this is the document you sent me earlier. Okay, uh, let's go to February 1st, 2008. Okay, you can just remove that and I'll talk through it. So, uh, as I mentioned before, Bill Bradley is talking the last, the last week of January, 2008, okay? Uh, the notion that Ukraine and Georgia would be admitted to NATO is very much in the air. And he's just, he's kind of lamenting the fact that it looks like uh, the, the no brain people were gonna go ahead and do this. Um, on February 1st, so the next week, uh, Ambassador Burns was invited into the foreign ministry at Moscow, Ambassador Bill Burns, who happens to be the head of the CIA right now. And, and what he said was, look, um, look, I, um, uh, what Lavrov, the foreign minister said, uh, he said, Mr. Burns, uh, do you know what Nyet means? <laughs> Burns said, yeah, I think so. 
He says, well, net means net. No admission in you for Ukraine into NATO. This is a red line for us. If that happens, there will be civil war in Ukraine and we Russians will have to decide whether we have to intervene or not. So tell your people, net means net. The 1st of February, 2008. Now to his credit, Burns, uh, Burns played it straight. The title of his, of his cable from Moscow is Cable 182, if you wish to know the number. He said, uh, net means net, Russia's NATO enlargement guidelines. So this is sent back to his boss, Condoleezza Rice, of all people. He said, Russia may have to intervene. Actually, he went farther than that. Uh, in those days, he had a little bit more courage than he has now. He said, uh, you know, Russia has real strategic interests in this area. And, you know, actually, uh, they're entitled to have <laughs> strategic interests in that area. So they went on a limb. Of course, what happened? What happened two months later, two months later at a NATO summit in Bucharest, okay? In Bucharest, um, NATO issued a declaration saying that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO, period, end quote. So having been forewarned, Cheney and Bush from the Lisa Rice, that the Russians would react in a very strong way, having been forewarned specifically that this was a red line, they went ahead anyway. That's 2008. Next, we get to February 2014. Well, when the, you can uh, actually, uh, yeah, I suppose we can just uh, just do without the uh, without the text uh, MR. I'm going to be jumping around because I must have given you the wrong text. Um, so we're down to February 22nd when the most blatant coup in history took place. It was on the Maidan in Kiev. Why the most blatant coup in history? Because it was advertised two and a half weeks in advance on YouTube. <laughs> Most of you know, I think last time I spoke to you, I played the tape of, of, of uh, Victoria Nuland talking to the ambassador that we had in, in Kiev at the time. So the US supported coup, uh, new, new officials are appointed and guess what the first thing they do? is said, we're gonna join NATO. Oh, and besides that, we're gonna ban Russian as an official language. So that's February 22nd, 2014. Well, this didn't go over well, and we know what happened. We know the annexation of Crimea. And actually I will point out tangentially that a month after Crimea was, was annexed back into Russia, Putin made a speech and he said, you know, we were motivated uh, partly by the notion that Ukraine might become part of NATO, but quote, more important, end quote, was the notion that there would be medium range ballistic missiles put in Crimea and the rest of Ukraine. Whoa, okay. From the very outset, he was worried about that. And he spoke to Western reporters about this. And he pointed out that, you know, these anti-ballistic missile sites that are going into or have been, gone into Poland, and no, I'm sorry, the, the ones who Romania and they're going into Poland, they can easily accommodate oh, cruise missiles, um, uh, Tomahawk missiles. Uh, they can accommodate hypersonic missiles if the US finally gets them. And uh, well, well, let's go along here and see what, what that would mean. December, 2021, so just last December. Uh, Putin addressed at some length uh, what could be called the state of the military uh, meeting there, big, big meeting there in Moscow. And he, he said, you know, this is very worrisome because these MK-41 launchers, which are already in Romania and are going into Poland, they're adaptable for launching Tomahawk strike missiles. And if US and NATO missiles are also deployed in Ukraine, their flight time 
would be only seven to 10 minutes, seven to 10 minutes, or even five minutes if we're talking about hypersonic systems. Quote, this is a huge challenge for us, for our security, end quote, Vladimir Putin on 21st of December last year. What happened? <laughs> well, he, he appended to those remarks, uh, or he, in the next couple of paragraphs, he said, so we really need, we really need a, 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 an ironclad written document this time. No promises. Uh, a written document so NATO won't do this. Now, this is interpretation, but I looked at the faces of those generals and admirals, and I, I could see them. I could see them thinking, right. Wasn't the ABM treaty written down? Uh, how about the INF treaty that prevented these guys? Wasn't that written down there, Vladimir Vladimirovich? Well, what do you know? 10 days later, the Kremlin gives a call to the White House and says, Mr. Putin wants to talk to Mr. Biden like now. The White House was flummoxed. Why now? Uh, we're, our negotiators, by mutual agreement, are meeting in Geneva in 9 and 10, beginning 9, 10 uh, January. Why now? Well, to his credit, uh, Biden said, okay, talk, talk now. We'll talk now. What, what was the outcome? Of that, uh, of that meeting. Uh, well, uh, we know the Russian readout, which has not been contradicted by any uh, US official. And uh, this is what it said on the 30th of December, quote, Joseph Biden, <laughs> call him Joseph, Joseph Biden emphasized that Washington had no intention of deploying offensive strike weapons in Ukraine. Now, there's a fellow named Yuri Ushakov, who is one of Biden's chief national security advisors, and he waxed eloquent about this the next day. He was very approving. He said, this meets a lot of Moscow's goals uh, in those draft treaties that they had surfaced earlier in December. And they had a really nice New Year's Eve there in Moscow. I thought, well, this is a really good way to get those negotiations started. After all, this is our prim primary strategic concern. Well, guess what? There's many a slip between cup and lip. And <laughs> six weeks later, when Putin and Biden talked again, uh, the readout was, well, Ushakov saying, uh, you know, we have to lament the fact that uh, in this follow-up discussion, follow-up to December 30th, um, Biden did not address the non-expansion of NATO or the non-deployment of strategic strike weapons on Ukrainian territory. To those we to these things, to these items, he said, we have received no meaningful response. Well, what does it all mean? Uh, to me, it means that uh, Putin and others might have felt a little diddled, or maybe Biden uh, promised too much, uh, and his, his successors or his his people said, "Joe, Joe, you can't let that go like that." And so there was no commitment by the U.S., despite President Biden's personal promise not to do that. Now that was the middle of February. There were other things going on. Uh, two major things. Uh, one of relative importance, and that is that the U.S., the NATO-trained Ukrainian forces were massed across the Donbass and seemed ready to go in and clean the Donbass out uh, after six, seven years of intensive training to NATO standards. That worried Putin. But the big factor, the bigger one, is the fact that he met with Xi Jinping on the 4th of February, and got his nihil obstat, his, uh, his okay to go ahead and do what he did on the 24th of February. Now, I never thought that the Chinese would acquiesce in that, 
Uh, my Chinese friends all advised me that they would never violate their supreme cardinal principle of non-interference in the interference, no, non-aggression, no, no, sacrosanct, you know, uh, Westphalia, okay? Well, they did. And instead of saying, well, Westphalia, they said, uh, we judge each set of circumstances on their own merits. And as you know, they abstained just yesterday the Chinese, the Indians, the South Africans. Well, you can do the math. Uh, if Russia is, ex is uh, now isolated, well, the math that I do it doesn't substantiate that. So I compare this to the Cuban Missile Crisis once again, and I say, well, you know, if Putin felt as Kennedy did, that there was an existential threat here, and that his, as all presidents, first duty is to, to protect their homeland, and then one can explain a little, little more uh, why things evolved the way they did at the end of February. Now, people say, McGovern, what are you in Putin's pocket or something? I mean, don't you, don't you hate Putin? I, no, I don't hate Putin. Intelligence officers don't hate anybody. Okay, sorry, but we, I don't. Uh, I, what I do is try to understand him. Yeah, but uh, wasn't that wasn't that illegal? Well, I let the lawyers argue about that. Wasn't what Kennedy did illegal? The point is simply, as John Mearsheimer says far more eloquently me than me, uh, when you when you face an existential threat, and when you have the means to meet that threat, a great power is going to do precisely that. And these uh, emplacements of missile sites uh, that could accommodate cruise missiles and hypersonic missiles on the periphery of Russia, I think uh, look the same way as the medium range ballistic missiles emplaced in Cuba exactly six years ago did to President Kennedy. And that's where I try to understand, you know, they come, the comeback is, well, don't you condemn it? And I say to myself, if I were Putin, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I would have done. I like to think that <laughs> I'm a nonviolent person. I don't know, you know, I'm not gonna be a hypocrite. I'm gonna say I condemn, I, I, I detest Putin and all that stuff. I'm trying to understand him, okay? And I'll just finish this little thing with a little, a little button. Actually, I think I have it right over here. Hang on for a second. I hadn't intended to show this, but if you could see this, uh, this is a button I got in Germany. It says, Putin versteher, okay? Somebody who understands Putin. This was about six, seven years ago. And I said, wow, wow, this, that's good. Somebody's trying to understand. No, 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 Ray, <laughs> this is a pejorative. This is awful. You wouldn't want to wear this thing in Germany. This means you're in Putin's pocket. Um, all right. I'm not in Putin's pocket. I try to look at things objectively. And I have to say that the little rundown that I just gave you on the facts and what Putin himself and others said, and the history of it going back to actually uh, 1990, and more recently, 2008, and then the coup in Kiev, nobody ever mentions the coup in Kiev on the 22nd of February. Um, and so people, it, people are, you know, I'm reminded of Will Rogers, uh, the great humorist. You know, he, he said, uh, the problem, what's the problem? Well, uh, the problem ain't what people know. The problem is what people know ain't so. That's the problem. And that's what I'm trying to do and my colleagues try to do to shed a little light on why Putin has acted the way he's done and what other issues need to be looked at in that light. Now, before I, I see I'm running, I'm running a little late here. I wanna say, my wife said, look, address the nuclear issue, Ray, for God's sake, people are worried about nuclear weapons. Well, in my point of view, uh, Putin has no reason to use nuclear weapons, except as usual, as a deterrent. 
Now, it was unusual that he raised this at the beginning when the invasion took place. That was unusual. Since then, and actually, there was no sign that they actually increased their readiness. That's interesting. So it was a rhetorical thing to remind, look, this is how seriously we take that. Don't forget that in, you know, when push comes to shove, we have nuclear weapons. Their doctrine is what has been repeated. We won't use them unless somebody uses them on us or we feel an existential threat to, to, to Russia, okay? So, you know, to the degree people want to make an existential threat to Russia, then and only then can we expect Russia to uh, resort to these weapons. And the main, main thing most people have been worried about that I talked to is the false flag possibility of somebody detonating a small nuclear weapon and blaming it on the Russians, and then we're off and running. So what is the threat? What is the nuclear threat? Well, there is one. It's called Zaporozhye, the biggest, biggest nuclear power plant in Europe. Now, the Ukrainians have been shelling that thing. IAEA, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency of the UN, went down to inspect. They had to have Russians kind of shepherd them in uh, so that they didn't get shelled. And then they saw the shelling, but they weren't allowed to say, oh, the shelling came from across the river. It came from the Ukrainians. They weren't able to say that, okay? Because uh, IEA is a non-political thing. Well, it's easiest pie to figure out where the shelling is coming. What's the danger? The danger is real. I have a good friend who knows about these things, and I want to read you what he sent me today. He said, the article that appeared in the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences doesn't mention that there are six spent nuclear fuel pools in Zaporozhye, in addition to the six reactors. And that each of those spent nuclear fuel pools has 10 to 20 Chernobyl's worth of radiation. So that in a worst case scenario, there will be 60 to 120 Chernobyl's worth of radiation. There will be six reactor meltdowns. They will release so much radioactivity, at least in the Northern hemisphere, that it may kill everyone. Plus there will be a cascading effect in which the nuclear power plants plus military nuclear plants sites will have their workers killed and all those sites will have their spent nuclear fuel pools boil off and reactors melt down, causing literally tens of thousands of Chernobyls. It was a minor admission in the article in the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences. Now, I used to think the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences was Bible. Uh, I've been disappointed in their lack of objectivity before this major lacuna, this major omission, uh, makes me want to think about where they're headed and how much influence they are by the authorities. Let me uh, do a couple of other things and then we can get to questions and answers. Um, Nord Stream. Uh, if you want to know about Nord Stream, all you have to do is read Scott Ritter's article in Consortium News this morning. It wraps things together in a pretty tight way. I recommend it highly to you. What next? Oh yeah, <laughs> I wanted to, to read you a comment I got that I wrote about, uh, uh, about the sanctions and you know who blew up the bridge and all this kind of stuff. And this was that the bridge show over the Kerch Straits. Here was the reaction I got from a fellow called Yankee Democracy. Quote, Breaking, to outdo the Europeans' self-harmy sanctions on Russia, Russia has now blown up its own bridge connecting it to Crimea. And this comes after blowing up its own underwater gas pipelines a week earlier. Go Russia! <laughs> so if, if you want to believe that Russia blew up its own pipelines, hey, it's a free country, as we used to say in the Bronx. I don't believe that for a minute. Kerch, oh, the Ukrainians have pretty much admitted that they did that. So there's a bunch of grievances here. 
and the direct retaliation that has happened from from Putin uh, is nothing more than what one would have expected, given this you know this this escalation of what now the Russians are calling terrorism. Um, I don't want to forget to talk about what we do, you know, besides educate people. I think what we need to do is uh, find out what each of us in our own particular milieu uh, can do. Now, I want to give you an example. Did you know that George W. Bush visited my new home, <laughs> my new hometown in Raleigh, North Carolina? You didn't know that. Neither did any of the people in Raleigh. You know why? <laughs> because I appointed myself part of the welcoming committee. <laughs> and we borrowed some slides from Roger Waters and we put them up on the biggest billboard in, uh, in Raleigh and it said, war criminal coming to Raleigh, September 16th, 2022. Now, apparently the Secret Service has advanced people and they go and think, oh, they probably told, <laughs> Uh, w, you know, this is not a really the nice crowd that laughed at you when you when you talked about attacking Iraq. They're a the nice crowd. You, you you better slither in here and slither out. Well, we never saw the welcoming committee, which had placards, and I had a ter terrific um, t um, sweatshirt that arrest Bush. Uh, the local police gave us the prime place to stand when all those Lexuses, or do you say Lexi? BMWs, Cadillacs, all these people came in to hear George W. Bush. We never saw Bush himself, but we had we made quite an impact. There were a couple of Toyotas that rolled down their windows. <laughs> that, okay? So what, what's my point? Well, um, all I'm saying here is that uh, Bush not only can't travel abroad, but if we could do in Raleigh with maybe 20 committed activists, and a little help from Roger Waters, uh, you guys could do something like that. When, uh, when an indignity like this president who, who started a, a unnecessary war and tortured people and so forth and so on, when they come to town, that's just a little bit of an example. Now, there are lots of things that others can do. Uh, my brother Larry uh, told me to remind people that if you have a little a gray in your hair, you have a big advantage. Now, what is that all about? Well, you know, Americans, uh, by and large, are, expect young people to get beat up, right? I mean, law, you know, that guy comes up, he's young, they're young demonstrators. Have, but you know what? When old people, and I can tell you this from my own experience, old people get beat up, they don't like that at all. So, old people, <laughs> old people have an advantage, and we ought to put it into play judiciously but you know times are getting short here we need to put it into play now i made an exception for when george w bush came my wife said please don't get arrested ray don't get beat up again and so i didn't i did the same thing when i was in ireland with uh, tarek kauf and uh ken ken uh ken uh, so I didn't get arrested there. So that, that was a lucky thing because they had to hang around and watch in uh, in Ireland for a long time. So all I'm saying here is that you can you can do uh, what what you can do in your peculiar circumstances. My good friend Colleen Rowley uh, during Iraq and Afghanistan. You know she's a senior lawyer, former FBI division counsel. And I've watched her on the floor tearing up sheets to hang on overpasses, saying no more war and this kind of thing in Minneapolis or cardboard and stuff. You know, if Colleen Riley can do this, you can do that too. What else? Well, you know, I know that uh, my brother Larry is going to uh, be seeing Seth Moulton tomorrow at noon. And uh, I understand he's, he's from up your way. There must be other people that could be seen. I've lost track of what my namesake, Jim McGovern, is doing, but he still remains the only person I ever gave any money to. 
when he was first becoming uh, politically active. So there, there have to be opportunities. And if, if uh, it includes uh, physical presence and that kind of thing, well, I think we have to be up to doing that because the hour is late. I'll finish with this. Uh, back during the Third Reich, uh, most of you know about uh, Friedrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, there was another major figure called Albrecht Haushofer. Now, Hofer, Haushofer was a uh, geolog. He was a geologist in Berlin. And he got tenure, you know how that is, he got tenure by keeping his mouth shut, right? They got tenure and then he started to have a conscience and he started to have a little following and he was protesting against Hitler. He got wrapped up and put in a different prison from uh, where, um, where Dietrich Bonhoeffer was. Bonhoeffer in that prison, they hanged you. In where uh, Haushofer was, they shot you. Now, the Germans are very, very methodical, as you know, and they said, okay, now uh, 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 you have to sign this confession before we shoot you. And, and Aldo says, nothing to do, I'm gonna sign a confession. You got to say, go ahead and shoot me if you like. I'm, I'm not confessing to anything. And so they shot him. And as he lay there, a little settle, a little piece of paper came out of his pocket. It was a sonnet. It was his confession. It was very brief. I'll read it to you. Doch. He titled it Schuld. Many of you will know that means guilt. Doch bin ich schuldig, aber anders als ihr denkt. Ich muss da früher meine Pflicht erkennen. Ich muss da schärfer. Unheil, unheil nennen, okay? Yeah, I'm guilty, but it's not what you're thinking. I should have earlier, stärker, uh, more powerfully called, uh, followed my conscience and spoken out. Mein Urteil habe ich zu lang gelenkt. I put my judgment off far too long. Ich habe gewarnt, I did warn, aber nicht genug und klar. Und heute weiß ich, was he surely far. I did warn, but not enough. Genug. And not klar. Claro. Clear. Clear. So I, I did warn, but not enough. And not clearly enough. Und heute and today, I see was he surely far. I know what I was guilty of. That's the sonnet. Okay. So, as Martin Luther King and others have said, there is such a thing as too late. What we need to do is get off our derriers, okay? And uh, call people names that they should be called if they're treacherous or if they're lying to us. And the last thing I'll say is from my, uh, yeah, again, my brother Larry suggested it. What do we call people like Blinken? What do we call people like Sullivan who still act out of their Ivy League uh, recognition that we are all powerful that we are exceptional, that we actually are indispensable. Well, very, very short vignette. I was up at the Harvard Business School for an in-residence program for three months, okay? Lots of CEOs in my class. At the end, we had to do a critique, of course. Well, it's had to do a critique. So we were all doing the same critique. And, you know, after the first page was, everybody turned the page at the same time. And on the top of page two, was Professor Vansel, long since dead, okay? Now, Vansel was the worst teacher we, we had. The others were excellent. So, so what happened? We turn the page and the CEO from Price Waterhouse shouts out in his Southern accent. He was in Atlanta. He said, hey guys, anyone know where the asshole is hyphenated? There are a lot of people needing hyphens. And whether we call them those kinds of things or not, we need to stand up to them because they can get us in a peck of trouble. Actually, existential threat is not any exaggeration in these days. Thanks for listening. And I'm really looking forward to your questions.
Great. Yay. Thank you, Ray, so much. That, that was uh, wonderful to listen to. Okay, so uh, a question that uh, came up a lot over uh, the last few months and weeks and today is people are curious, Ray, what does a negotiated peace settlement look like? What steps would the United States and NATO have to take for a negotiated peace settlement to this conflict? Well, my view is that uh, this is one that Putin can't afford to lose, just as Kennedy couldn't afford to lose out in Cuba. Uh, my, my view as, a, as an army intelligence officer is that you look at the estimate of the situation to try to figure out where the enemy is, how many they are, what kind of weapons they have, and LOCS, L-O-C-S, Lines of Communication and Control or Supply, okay? Now, if you look at the map, for God's sake, and you see the existential threat that I believe Russia faces, uh, Russia can't afford to lose. Does that mean they'll no, 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 use nuclear weapons? They don't need to use nuclear weapons. Uh, what you can see them doing over the last three days is bad enough. If that continues for another week, uh, the Ukrainians are going to be really in sad shape. Uh, was this provoked by these, what the Russians call terrorist incidents? The stuff in Zaporozhye? The stuff under the Baltic? The stuff on the Kerch Bridge? Well, those are provocations to be sure. Uh, whether the Russians are waiting for those or not, they're doing it. So what can NATO do? Well, NATO can can provide still greater range missiles, right? Okay. Well, last time they did that with these high Mars, okay, they go 50 miles. What Foreign Minister Lavrov said is, okay, uh, we were going to set settle for uh, for the Donbas. Uh, and now geography dictates that we go at least 50 miles farther, okay? That's what he said. So the, the, the name of the game here is the balance of power. In my view, Russia has it. It can't afford to lose this. It has the wherewithal to win it. Uh, unless Biden and NATO want to say what they don't want, want to do what they say they don't want to do, risk a third world war, uh, by and large, uh, they're going to have to pull back. And I just hope they do that sooner rather than later, because people are dying, you know. Ukrainians are getting killed all over the place. Ukrainians from no fault of their own, are, and Russians and, and others are getting killed on that battlefield. So why prolong the why prolong the misery when uh, the outcome is very much likely to be uh, as, as favorable to the West now as it's ever going to be? That's my view. Can you, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the connection between uh, this, this conflict in Ukraine and the uh, energy and political crisis in Germany and Europe? Sure. Yeah, I, I mentioned or I allude, alluded to that before. Um, the, the latest news is that uh, those folks who sabotage the Nord Stream pipelines, don't know who it could possibly be. <laughs> Reed's got read his article. Uh, they, they screwed up. They missed one. Uh, one line from the Nord Stream is functional. And as I mentioned yesterday, Putin said, look, uh, we, can, we can make that thing functional. We can, uh, all we need is German permission to turn the spigot on and you guys don't have to freeze to death in Germany this winter, nor does your industry have to suffer incalculable losses. Now, I had a friend who, uh, who caustically said, well, you know, do you think the Germans can rise up before they're, before they're stuck on their knees to the ice, before they act like adults? I don't know. Uh, I served two tour tours in uh, Germany. I'm fluent in German. I have a lot of good German acquaintances. Uh, but you know, uh, they tend to be very, very obedient uh, and very, very risk averse. And they don't want to 
defy Big Brother the United States. So uh, are they willing to tolerate a winter where their economy is buffeted and where their people are very, very cold? The sensible answer to that is they shouldn't. They should turn on that spigot. But, you know, I've been saying they should stand up to the U.S. <laughs> for decades now, and they never do. And it's 77 years now, for God's sake, since the end of the war. So if they do, and I hope they do, you know, that'll be the first time. First time on so momentous an issue. And they would have to, they have to evade the sanctions. They'd have to work out a deal with Germany. And some people think, and it's a reasonable speculation, that they were already working and making out a deal with between Germany and Russia at a pretty high level just before, surprise, surprise, somebody sabotaged those pipes. Yeah, so, so they took that option off the table for Germany, except unless the pipelines are still working or some of them. One of them is, yeah. Um, but can you can you talk more about uh, uh, the relationship between Russia and China? This is uh, this is the quintessential question. Uh, there used to be a triangular relationship. Uh, I know because uh, my portfolio was Sino-Soviet relations way back uh, five decades ago. Okay, they were at loggerheads then. They hated each other. We thought they'd hate each other forever and ever and ever. They had irredenta. China was claiming uh, 1.5 million square kilometers of Russian territory. They were shooting at each other across the border. Okay. Now, we reported that that looked very real and looked like maybe somebody could take advantage of that. Kissinger and Nixon did precisely that. So there was this triangular relationship, and Nixon went to China. Whoa! What did that do? That made the Russians very, very worried. They didn't want the Chinese to develop cordial relationships with the United States before they did. They don't want to be outmatched, okay? And so I, as chief of the Soviet foreign policy branch in those days, watched the Russians have more flexibility, more give more willingness to compromise. And you know what happened? The four power agreement on Berlin happened. That's what happened, okay? Never happened before. And more important even, the anti-ballistic missile treaty was signed in Moscow in May, 1972. I had the privilege of being there. Uh, I was so elated because I knew that would cause the that would be the bedrock of strategic stability. Call it the balance of terror, if you will, but at least it would be stable. And it was for 30 years, 30, count them, three zero, until W. Bush says, Well, let's get out of there. And they got out of it. To the consternation of the Russians, what did the US have in mind by getting out of the ABM treaty? Well, no answer. But then Trump, in his last year, gets out of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. My God, <laughs> well, the Russians, what, what did the Russians get by way of explanation? Nothing, none of your business. Well, then they saw these little sites disguised as ABM sites going in on their periphery, okay? And then they saw that the capsules, as they call them, are exactly the same <laughs> diameter as those that would accommodate cruise missiles and eventually hypersonic missiles when the US gets them. Okay, great. All right, so there's a lot of questions piling up. There's a lot in the chat. So I'm gonna do my best to uh, get, get to as many as we can. I'm just going to ask everyone, uh, please, if you have questions, if you could put them in the chat, that'll make it easier to uh, manage. Um, okay, so Ray, we're gonna take a question uh, on, on a slightly different topic from, Rosemary Keene, uh, who is the co-chair of the board of Massachusetts Peace Action. She, she says, uh, we know a lot about US war crimes, but the US is still trying to kill Assange. What are your thoughts about this? Julian Assange is a friend of mine. Uh, I try to get over 
any emotion here. Uh, what I will say is that this is the end of press freedom if it goes forward. Uh, look at it. I mean, here is an Australian, right? He's not American. And he's being persecuted for telling the truth, the unimpeachable truth, okay? Why? Because the truth had to do with US war crimes in Iraq, Afghanistan, and some of those State Department cables were pretty bad as well. So they got him. How'd they get him? They used the Swedish liaison to get him, all right? False charges about rape. Typical arrow in the quiver of intelligence services. There was no rape. Those women were distraught that the, that the Sw Swedish police proceeded to make those kinds of announcements because all they wanted was for Julian to take some AIDS tests. Uh, and he wouldn't do that. Uh, he, he wanted to hang around in Sweden to answer these charges, but there were no charges. And so he left. So what I'm saying here is that he was captured. Uh, he was still able to do things from the embassy in uh, Ecuadorian embassy in London, where I visited him several times. Uh, he did things really, things that appeared heinous to the United States. Once I was sitting with Julian on the couch and, and I said, you know, Julian, I admire a lot of what you did, how you've created this fifth estate to get truth out into the ether. But you know what? I, I, the thing I admire most about you, that you got Ed Snowden out of Hong Kong safely so he wasn't scooped up and put in a, a maximum uh, detention center prison. Now, Julian is a pretty taciturn fellow, and but this time he jumps off the couch and he says, yes, yes, <laughs> we had to make it possible that somebody who told the truth didn't uh, end up in the clutches of the authorities. And as many of you know, he called in all his ships. He had Sarah Harrison, one of his lieutenants, go there, and they got him out. How'd they get him out? Well, uh, you could you could figure out the story from stuff that has already been published. But Julian had a lot of contacts in that part of the world, not only in the high rises, okay, <laughs> not only among the hoi or stoi. He had contacts among the hoi polloi, and that's where they hid. And that's how they scampered onto that aerofloat uh, uh, airplane. And uh, in the in the flight to Moscow, his citizenship was revoked. His his passport was taken, and so there he stayed in the Shedemyetov Airport for six weeks before Putin said, "All right, you can come on in." Uh, it, it's sort of a, it's the law, really, international law, to accept. Uh, political asylees, and if there's any political asylee, it's you, so we let him in. Now, later they asked Putin, I said, do you think he did the right, do you think, do you think Ed Snowden did the right thing? And Putin said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I mean, here's Putin, KGB type. Uh, he wants to create a precedent where some of his own guys could do, <laughs> do the same thing. So he says, no, no. But what did he do just three weeks ago? Gave him citizenship. So Ed and his two children and his wife are living in Russia in exile, eager as hell to come home, but not willing to accept the fate that Julian Assange is having to accept. And I mention that because Julian is the saddest of all cases. Once it becomes known that if you want to report on U.S. war crime or something that the U.S. doesn't like, they're going to get you. How are they going to get you? Doesn't matter. They're going to get you because we have the capability of getting you. If you're talking to your lawyer, we'll hear it. If you're dealing with your friends, we'll listen to that too. And if you live in Antarctica or Australia or Greenland or Norway, we're going to get you. Doesn't American citizen? Doesn't matter. We're going to get you. So the whole thing is to show how brutal this is. And uh, you know, as far as uh, the security authorities in our country are concerned, uh, you know. What Julian has done is, is really terrible by helping Ed Snowden and then not least by publishing what's called Vault 7, which is the 
which is information on offensive cyber tools developed by the CIA and NSA at the cost of several billion dollars. All, well, not all, but some of them frittered away by what Julian, by what Julian published from wherever he got them. Now, that's when they really went after him. Uh, Pompeo got up and said, Julian Assange is a non-state intelligence service, hostile intelligence service. We're going to get him. And of course, they got him. Why? Because the British are sort of like a, a vassal state for us. We're still hoping that the British will remember uh, Runnymede and still have some judicial competence and character. But uh, well, we'll just see what happens. We're, we're hoping that Julian will. He has COVID now. I don't know if any of you knew that. He's in isolation there in Belmarsh Prison with COVID. So, yeah, uh, he deserves a lot better. He's a hero in my view. And uh, he always said, you know, the truth will win in the end. I hope that I have to believe that that's true and that Julian doesn't suffer any more than he already has. Thanks, Ray. And thanks, Rosemary, for uh, bringing up that question. Um, Ray, Ray, I've heard, uh, I've come across people say that this conflict has made apparent uh, this transition from a unipolar world to a multipolar world. The US sanctions on Russia uh, did not destroy the Russian economy or the Russian ruble, which is stronger than it was in February. China, India, and others continue to do business with Russia, buy Russian gas and oil. Uh, do, do you have a comment on that? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I used to think that uh, Biden's political advisors were bad, but I think his economic advisors may be still worse. They don't seem to appreciate what's going on in the world. Uh, how could they misjudge Russia's ability to rise above the sanctions? How could they misjudge the, the melding together of resource rich Russia and resource needy China with lots to offer Russia uh, in return? And that, as I started to say before, is the real, uh, the real difference in the correlation of forces right now. I started to say there was a triangular relationship and now it's, I don't know if you remember your geometry, but it's now it's an isosceles triangle, okay? And the U.S. is on the short end of thing. Russia and China are in effect allies. Is, is Russia isolated? Uh, if you have an ally like China, and if you have India abstaining on these votes, if you have South Africa abstaining on these votes, you know, if you just count the people in these countries, and the strength of them, think about China. Now, Russia is not isolated. They've driven Russia and China together in a way that they have never been so close before. And as I said, I think before, I think unless Z, the Chinese pr uh, president, unless Xi Jinping uh, said, okay, um, uh, if you have to do this, then go ahead and and do what you have to do in Ukraine. We won't criticize it. Uh, we won't uh, uh, side with the, those that want to vilify you. Uh, it's hard for us on, in our principal position to, to endorse it. I mean, after all, we're West, Westphalia people, right? But we'll change that formula too. We'll say that now we judge each country according to what it does to protect its core interests, like existential threat, okay? And we'll say that we judge each situation according to its merits. That's a far cry from Westphalia. I remember in uh, 2014, reading the mainstream corporate news and reading a lot about the uh, annexation of Crimea by Russia. I, it wasn't until years later when I read Stephen Cohen's book, I actually learned a lot from Stephen Cohen's writing. Uh, he said that, he, he wrote that people in Crimea and people in Russia, they, they actually don't refer to it using that word annexation. They, they call it a reunification. And uh, I, I, I just think about that uh, 
in the context of these current referendum, um, when the when the corporate media calls them illegitimate, but then I hear someone like uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor saying, "No, they are legitimate." Uh, so, what 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 do you think? Well, the legalities aside for a moment, uh, Crimea always was part of Russia since Catherine the Great. Okay, she beat the Turks off and established Sevastopol, the only warm water port that the Russian Navy enjoys. So uh, think about Victoria Nuland, who was sort of the intellectual author, if you could call it that, of the coup in Kiev. Did she really think that Putin would acquiesce in NATO taking over Russia's sole naval, ice-free, all-year-round base? Well, you know, these people are a little weird. They might have thought that since we're so exceptional that the Russians would just say, oh, okay, ah, you know, bummer, you know. But, you know, if there's anything that any person know about Russia would have predicted was that they would at least take Crimea back. Now, how did Crimea get to be part of Ukraine? It's very simple. Back in 1954, remember Stalin died in 1953, right? Okay. So 1954, this guy, Nikita Khrushchev, rises to the top. He's, he's born and bred just a couple of miles in Russia proper from, from Ukraine, in the Russian region. Uh, but he's got really a lot of support in Ukraine. And one day he says, you know, I think I can increase that support if I uh, did a little ukaz. You know, ukaz is a little, just a little order that uh, kings and uh, Soviet party chiefs can do. And I'll give, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll give uh, Crimea to, to Ukraine. Does it matter? <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. We're all part of the Soviet Union, right? We're all constituent republics of the Soviet Union. It doesn't matter, right? But it gives me some political support. That's the way I interpret that. I don't know if there's a better way of interpreting why Khrushchev did that. But it didn't matter at the time. It did matter, of course, when Ukraine became an independent country. Now, what did the Russians do? Well, they said, all right, you're an independent country now, but we need that naval base. So let's sign, a, I think it was a 50-year lease for this much money, and uh, we'll be able to, uh, to station 20 to 30,000 troops there. And so, so they worked out a deal. It was all very amicable, and there were the Russians in Crimea uh, with their naval base. Now, when the coup took place, and it became clear that Russia would be forbidden as an official language, and that Ukraine wanted to join NATO, the people in Crimea, fearing what it would mean to have a new body in Kiev ruling them and uh, discriminating against the Russian speakers, uh, they clearly were not in favor of being assimilated into this new Ukraine. So what happened? Well, Putin got back from the Sochi Olympics on the 23rd of February, the day after the coup. And he, he convened his advisors and said, what are we going to do about Crimea? And uh, they said, well, the Crimeans want, want us to take them in. Of course, they're all mostly Russian speakers. They're Russian stock. You know? So he said, well, yeah, but how do we do that? Well, that's what Khrushchev did. He, he took a piece of paper and he, he did a little, did a little ukaz. So why don't you do ukaz? He says, well, no, I don't think we should do that. Let's have a plebiscite. And they did. And the plebiscite, not surprising, it was over 90% people wanted to rejoin Russia. And, and Putin approved that. Of course, a month later, they were back in Russia. And as I think I said before, Putin said, you know, we moved on Crimea. We reincorporated Crimea partly because of NATO's designs or NATO's or Ukraine's acquiescence in joining NATO or wanting to join NATO. But mostly, more important, we feared the emplacement of offensive strike missiles that is medium range ballistic missiles of the kind Khrushchev put in Cuba 
in Crimea and the rest of Ukraine. So um, from the very beginning, uh, that's 14, 2014, uh, uh, Putin was very explicit about his fear that these, this territory, Crimea, the rest of Ukraine, uh, might become host to intermediate range ballistic missiles. Uh, and indeed, when Trump got out of the intermediate range ballistic missile treaty, that enhanced their fears. And indeed, uh, when these capsules uh, went into Romania, they're already there. They're going into Poland. They're almost finished there. Then he extracted the promise, as I said before. Remember? December 30th, frantic call from the Kremlin. Putin wants to talk to Biden, like now. And they talk. And the readout is, Joseph Biden said that the U.S. had no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in, in Ukraine, period, end quote. Six weeks later, as you may recall from earlier, six weeks later, uh, what happened? Well, six weeks later, Biden and Putin talked again. And this time, there was not uh, any merriment on the Russian side. It was a lot of chagrin, because as, as Ushakov, his main advisor, said, um, Biden didn't say anything about his former promise to prohibit intermediate range ballistic missiles or what the Russians call offensive strike missiles in, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. So, you know, the Russians have been diddled. They were diddled in 1990. You know that story. Bill Bradley told it to you a little while ago. They were diddled all along on Ukraine. And finally, when, when uh, Putin extracted this promise from Biden, next morning, obviously, Biden woke up and his advisor said, you didn't really say that, did you, Joe? <laughs> what, you can't do that? Now, Biden is not his own man, as most of you realize. So he was counter countermanded. And, and what's this look like to, to Putin? Who's in charge there in Washington? This is really important. Biden says he doesn't want a third world war. And yet he's got crazy admirals, people in what's what used to be SAC, the Strategic Air Command. Now it's the STRATCOM. People out in the Seventh Fleet uh, saying, oh, yeah, we got these uh, we, we got a lot of nuclear missiles. We could use small ones. Or, yeah, we might do it. It's almost inevitable. Now, what's Putin going to think about that? He already knows from Ellsberg's book, which has been given to him in Russian translation, that the authority to use nuclear weapons way back when, decades ago, devolved to some tactical units, if you can believe it. Read the doomsday machine. Read what Ellsberg has to say about this. It's scary as hell. So if you only have a few minutes of warning time, launch to target, I mean, does it really make a lot of sense to get on the phone with, with Mr. Putin that, well, you know, we think this is real. Should we? In other words, Putin doesn't want to have seven to 10 minutes for cruise missiles or five minutes for hypersonic missiles to decide whether to blow up the rest of the world. Would he blow up the rest of the world? I'm convinced he would. He has said so. He, would, he said something to the effect that what would the world look like without Russia? So that's how, that's how important all this is. And that's why I just hope that judiciousness prevails on, in Washington and that we don't uh, perpetrate this kind of uh, risk so that uh, these things are, are employed. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I'm gonna make one quick note uh, before returning to questions. It's 8.22 uh, in the Eastern time zone here. And uh, Ray has been very gracious with this time. Uh, we're going to go uh, until nine or possibly sooner. So there's a lot of questions. There's over a hundred people in the Zoom right now and over a hundred people watching on social media as well. So I'm going to take a question. Uh, Carolyn Scar sent in a question. She wrote, I recall reading that US special forces were planning to train contingent in Iraq to fight under the US. 
Uh, might there be uh, U.S. training of special forces in Ukraine? Uh, there might be. Actually, there are. <laughs> it, it's no secret. They're there. Uh, a lot of them are getting wounded or killed. Uh, it's really become a proxy war, and uh, it's uh, it's a very short slip into into an openly declared war. I mean, the Russians have said, look, we're not fighting Ukraine. We're fighting NATO and the United States. And they are involved to the extent of not only equipping these people, but advising them and giving them satellite intelligence so that they know exactly where Russian troops are and where to target their, their rockets such as they are. So uh, something's got to give here. And uh, I, my, my guess, my guess is that the, the midterms coming up in just four weeks, uh, they're going to have some sort of effect on what Putin decides to do. One would have thought that he would sort of wait it out and uh, just see what happens. But I think he's on the offensive now. I think he feels that he's sort of much, pretty much justified in retaliating for these terrorist attacks. I mean, he calls them terrorist attacks. <laughs> they are terrorist attacks, okay, including the ones at the Zaporozhye. And uh, the momentum is Russia's. Where he stops, I don't know. Uh, I don't think he'll go as far as Odessa or Transnistria, but he certainly has a lot of consolidation to do, to do in Donetsk and in, uh, uh, in, those, in Lugansk is okay. Those are the two provinces that they, that they uh, annexed need extra work. So there's going to be a lot of solidifying and there's those Russian reserve troops that are coming in. Uh, 300,000 is the, the number that are being recruited. Uh, they'll be put to work. Now, uh, in the winter, tanks still go pretty well. In the spring, uh, not so well because of melting ice. So I don't know what's in store for this, uh, for folks uh, in the next few months. And I'm not real sure, I'm not, I'm not sure what kind of effect it will have on the midterms, but I don't think Putin is, is going to be um, it's going to be plugging that consideration. And I think he's, he's on, the, on the path now uh, to go ahead and see if he can maintain the momentum. And if anybody tells you that uh, the Ukraine is winning, uh, well, uh, let's take Petraeus, for example. Uh, he told us that the Iraqis were winning, didn't he? He trained up those Iraqis so well that they ran at the first scare from ISIS. Uh, these guys, these talking heads, I mean, why they're given this, this chance to spread around this rubbish, I'll never know. But most Americans will be very shocked. And this is dangerous. They'll be very shocked when it turns out that the Ukrainians are not winning. Despite all this material support, they're not winning. And the Russia has the upper hand. Just look at the map and try to be a military intelligence officer and see who has the higher cards. Thanks, Ray. Uh, yeah, so what I, what I was saying a second ago was that uh, what I meant to say was, I don't, I don't want anyone to feel tired or exhausted. So if anyone has to sign off, we understand this program is being recorded and uh, we'll make the recording available. So no one should feel any pressure, but there's a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, so Ray, I'm gonna give you two questions from the chat. Uh, Nicholas is asking, uh, who's uh, more likely to first use nuclear weapons in this conflict, Russia or uh, the US slash NATO? And uh, let me give you a second question. Uh, Jay, Jay is asking, in addition to John Mersheimer, uh, who else uh, are you reading, talking to, or listening to, to get a better understanding of this conflict? Uh, first question, uh, who is likely to use nuclear weapons first? Yes. No one. I tried at the outset to put people at, at ease about that. Uh, no one needs to use them. Uh, you, the, the Russians don't need to use them. It would be a big mistake for them to use them. There are all kinds of considerations where they should not be used. With the NATO? Well, the only fear I have, and it's shared by people who know a lot more about this than I do, is a false flag. In other words, if the Ukrainians are being driven back 
and there needs to be some new element, new, new terrorism, if you will, uh, of the kind on the bridge, of the kind underwater in the Baltic, then I would not put it beyond NATO special services, to put it that way, to detonate some sort of small nuclear explosion and blame it on the Russians. I mean, that sounds awful, doesn't it? But that's the only set of circumstances that I can, that I can perceive that any nuclear uh, weapons will be used. Now, there are a lot of crazy people in Washington. Uh, if if uh, Biden escalates to the point of giving really great range uh, uh, artillery and so forth, well, even then, I, yeah, please relax. It's not gonna happen. The real danger, as I said before, uh, is Zaporozhye where all those uh, pools are just waiting to be detonated. The, the, continue shelling there. And it's not the Russians shelling their own uh, Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. It's, you know, it's not the Russians doing that, for God's sake, despite what the IAEA can't say. Uh, it's, it's the Ukrainians. Now, let me just make a little point. I am uh, always impressed that the Russians really like to follow and, and applaud the UN capability uh, to, to do what it was set up to do. Uh, they applaud the UN, they applaud uh, international law. Uh, in reality, their experience has been quite different. Now take the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. That used to be a really independent outfit, okay? Who remembers? Who remembers when yellow cake Uranium was said to be taken from deepest, darkest Africa and brought to, uh, to be refined and made into atomic bombs by Iraq. Who remembers that? <laughs> well, that was the story. That was Dick Cheney. That was his imagination, okay? Now, what happened? Well, finally, the IAEA asked for proof. And they were given what the U.S. had. And less than 24 hours later, El Baradai, who headed up the IAEA in those days, reported to the UN Security Council, and he said, these reports about, uh, uh, about yellow cake uranium going to Iraq are not authentic. <laughs> there were forgeries, for God's sake. And, and the IAEA people at the time were given their head and they said it was forgery. Those were forgeries. Okay, now what happened? Well, he left. Amano came in. What do we know about Amano? Well, we know from WikiLeaks exposures that the US put him in there and that he, he exchanged messages with the US ambassador saying, look, you know, uh, thanks, thanks a lot for putting me in here. I need some new drapes from my office and I know a little. A couple thousand more for being elected. <laughs> so Amano was our man. And now there's nothing that the UN does in any real way. Uh, Gutierrez is, is from hunger, as we used to say in the Bronx, uh, that, uh, that the US doesn't pretty much control. And so here, I was going to suggest, well, who's going to investigate the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines? Oh, it's going to be the Swedes, oh, same ones that framed Julian Assange, the Swedes, the Danes, also part of NATO now, and the Germans. Now, they're not letting the Russians do it? No, not letting, who owns the pipeline? Well, 51% of the Russians. No, I not <laughs> So Putin, I think, said today, you know, whatever you guys decide, it's it's not going to be credible because you're, you're not letting us participate. How about the German that can participate? So he looks at the, the damage. He's an expert and he sees uh, where it leads. And uh, what's he going to do? Is he going to say, oh, I think the Russians did it? <laughs> I don't know. But the Germans have a lot of stake in this. Will they stand up against the Swedes and the Danes? I don't know. We'll see what happens. But uh, the problem is, getting back to my primary point, the UN is very much under the 
under the power of the United States. Gutierrez has done very little, very little, and he too is afraid. And he's certainly not unbiased in how he's uh, how he's uh, handled the Ukrainian thing. So uh, it's to the Russians' credit, I would say, that they still say the UN has to be involved in these things. We think the UN and international law is what we should follow, and not rule-based international order. Anybody know what that is? Look it up. Google it. Rules-based international. There isn't any. <laughs> we make the rules. That's what we base the international order on. Come on. That's, uh, that's because we're exceptional and indispensable. You know, I, I ask college classes when I talk. And I say, you know, we're indispensable, right? Oh, yeah, okay. So what's, uh, do you know what synonyms are? Synonyms are? And they say, yeah, we're, that's a like word. Do you know what an antonym is? Usually one or two say, yeah, that's, a, that's an opposite word. I say, okay, so what's an, what's an antonym for indispensable? And they go, uh, dispensable? <laughs> yeah, right, you got it. So if the U.S. is indispensable, it sort of means that all these other countries are, are dispensable. Now, just a final thought on this. There was a high point in U.S. Soviet, sorry, U.S. Russian relations. It was September 2013. The neocons wanted Obama to strike Syria openly with U.S. military forces, Tomahawk missiles and the rest of them. Uh, shock and all. Obama, to his credit, didn't want to do that. Okay, who bailed them out? Anybody know? Putin. Obama went up to Putin for one of these G7 meetings, met Putin, and Putin said, look, I know that you don't want to make a, a, a new war on Syria. I got a solution for you. And we've worked out with the Syrians that they're willing to have all their chemical weapons destroyed under UN supervision on a ship specifically outfitted for such destruction. You have a couple of them, maybe we can use your ship. And Obama said, really? <laughs> yeah, listen to the Syrian foreign minister tomorrow. And indeed, that's what he said. So Obama said, well, thank you very much. I don't have to make a war. Later, he told Jeffrey Goldberg, you know, this was against the Washington playbook, but I did the right thing and I'm proud of it. What happened? Well, what happened was that Putin had an op-ed in the New York Times on the 12th of September, 2013. And he said, I am very encouraged by the increased trust, not only between our two countries, but between our two people, myself and President Obama. I do have one major difference with President Obama. Last week, he said that the US was the exceptional country in the world. I don't believe that any country is exceptional. I think that there are big countries and small countries. There are countries that are closer to democracy and others struggling to be. The, but I think when God looks down at all these countries, he sees them all as equal, period, end quote. Last paragraph in the op ed. I was reliably told at the time, Putin etched that paragraph himself and confirmation of a sort came two years later when he was asked during an impromptu interview, this same question and <laughs> used almost precisely the same terms. So what they objected to, the, the Russians did, uh, was this exceptionalism. And that's what still obtains here. And the only problem is that we're not exceptional anymore. We're just one of, well, they, they say multipolar. The way I look at it, it's bipolar <laughs> in both senses. Okay, let's put it in the political sense. It's bipolar. It's the lily white West against Russia, China, India, 
people of color, South Africa, Brazil, or, you know, it's, it's a cleavage here. It's a bipolar rather than a multipolar. You can look at it both ways, of course. But to think that Russia is now isolated, as we keep hearing on MSNBC and elsewhere, you know, that's like, uh, it, that's not really true. And no one should believe that. No one should believe anything that comes out of our major media. Our position here is we, um, we, we support uh, diplomacy and negotiations and we're, we, we don't support uh, weapons transfers uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we think that would escalate the conflict. We want to de-escalate. Uh, but in the United States Congress, when they vote on sending weapons to Ukraine in recent weeks and months, it's been uh, all the Democrats have supported it and the only people who have opposed it are some Republicans in the House. Do you have any comment on our domestic politics here? Well, domestic politics is not my fort. Um, all I can say is that uh, we have kind of a, a joining of two parties pers uh, pursuing the same uh, ill-fated, benighted uh, selling of, uh, of our country down the, down the road. Uh, what I mean is this, um, these billions and billions of dollars, you know, talk about opportunity costs. Think of how they could be used. Think of how just one F-35 fighter that's probably never going to even work, the money spent on that could be used to refurbish schools and build roads and re repair bridges and all that kind of stuff. Just think about it. teacher salaries and things like that. So, you know, it's really, really sad to see that both parties are supporting what I call the Mickey Mat. Now, Eisenhower, of course, warned as he left about the MIC, M-I-C, the Military Industrial Complex. He said they have already aggrandized, if that's the word, more power than ever before. And if they have an accretion of power, still more democracy is damaged and uh, in jeopardy. The only solution, says Ike, is a well-informed citizenry. We ain't got a well-informed citizenry. Worse still, we have not the Mick, but the Mickey Mat. Remember it, it reminds, it rhymes sort of with Mickey Mouse, okay? I'll spell it out for you. you. Got a pencil? Military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, academia, think tank, complex. Mickey Mat. And why do I say media as if in all caps? Because media is the linchpin. You can't do this stuff without the media. And now how many people know from the media that that money is not going to Ukraine, it's going to Raytheon, it's going to Lockheed Martin, it's going to Boeing, it's going to all these fat cats who are worried about their uh, cruisers and their, 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 they don't know, well, they're worried about accumulating still more wealth. And, uh, you know, it's time for people to recognize that they're not going to stop. There's never enough wealth that uh, will satisfy them. And we have to kind of stand up to them and go to their congressional offices and, and make sure we, they know that we know what the score is. They appropriate the money. The military industrial congression you know, makes the weapons. They sell the weapons. They get some of the profits and they put it in the po pockets of the, uh, of the, of the Congress people and they get reelected. And then they appropriate more money. And I, hello, it's a really neat cycle. Is this, is this, this great or what? So the only person that really, <laughs> yeah, this, I have to tell you this. I don't agree with what Pope, uh, Pope Francis says on everything, but I admire him for standing in front of the Congress of the United States, two houses and saying, the problem, the main problem is the blood drenched arms trade. And what happened? 
Oh, they all get up and say, oh, yeah, whoa. <laughs> then they looked in their pockets to make sure the last envelope from Lockheed was there and the one from Raytheon. I mean, it was giving hypocrisy a bad name, right? Well, he was right. That's what's wrong. And, you know, if we don't choose the opportunity, this particular juncture, so to rise up against this kind of thing in whatever way we can, well, we're, uh, we're not doing what uh, we need to do in what Tom Paine called, you know, the winter of our, we're not winter soldiers if we're not able to do what we can to expose these people and to make them unelected or to just try to make people realize that Raytheon and Lockheed shouldn't be ruling our country. Nahid in the chat is asking, how would history judge Zelensky? Uh, Zelensky? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's a terrific, terrific actor. Uh, he's, you know, in reality, he's a pawn. Um, I dare say my impression is that he has not much regard for the Ukrainians that continue to die in droves, die just so that Ukraine can appear to be still in the battle. That was the whole, that was the whole point behind the recent Ukrainian offensive. They wanted to make sure that NATO didn't have any doubts about their ability to continue. So I have a very poor idea of Zelensky. Uh, worse still, uh, his puppet masters uh, are not, uh, are using him in a way that really hurts the Ukrainian people. And he's a pretty smart guy. It's hard for me to believe that he doesn't realize that. Okay. Um, all right. So I think we can start getting ready to wrap up the program now. Unless people, uh, I'm seeing some questions come in. But I think Ray, you might have addressed some of these throughout the night. So yeah, so I think we're going to get ready to wrap up the program. Uh, I'm going to read. I'm going to read a quote. Hold on, let me <clears throat> let me find it. Okay, this is a quote I came across uh, this week. Quote: With potentially hundreds of thousands of people dying, we must demand the immediate negotiation of the peaceful end to the war in Ukraine or we will end up in World War III and there will be nothing left of our planet all because stupid people didn't have a clue. That's, uh, that quote is from pre our, our former president, Donald Trump, uh, from a rally on Saturday in Arizona. So I just thought it was interesting, ironic, that uh, Donald Trump is the most prominent person in our discourse calling for peaceful negotiations to end this conflict. Well, you know, let me comment on, on this. Um, not so much on, on Trump, but on the media and the machinations of our Congress. Now, you'll remember uh, the Bob Mueller investigation and all that kind of stuff, right? Back in 16, 2016, 2017, 2018. Well, uh, it turns out that on December 5th, 2017, the head of CrowdStrike, uh, the cyber firm to which James Comey deferred in looking at the DNC, Democratic National Committee computers, uh, testified before the House Intelligence Committee, so December 5th. And he was put through the, through the drills. And what did he say? He said, there's no technical evidence of Russian hacking in the, 19, in the 2016 election. Whoa, no technical evidence. We didn't see the Russians steal anything from the DNC. Oh, December 5th, 2017. Well, now the head of CrowdStrike, his name was Sean Henry. He worked for Mueller for about 12 years. He was his techie guy. 
did he not tell Bob Mueller about this? <laughs> Hard to believe. What was Mueller doing? He was keeping this investigation going. He was keeping it going. Okay. So why was Mueller keeping it going? I realized this later. Because of the midterms. As long as people could say that it looks like President Trump was under the heel of the Russians. If it looked like the Russians had hacked the DNC to embarrass Trump or to embarrass Hillary so Trump could get elected. Whoa, that, uh, you know. So what happened was Mueller waited till the midterms were over. And then next spring, he did his thing, okay, to, to the degree it was. Now, what happened in the interim? The Democrats won the House back. That matters because the head of the Democrats, Democratic Intelligence Committee, was Adam Schiff. And even though this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this, this report was labeled unclassified, but committee sensitive, he deep sixed it. He didn't let it out. What did it say? Once again, it said there was no physical evidence of Russian hacking. Whoa. Now, how long was he able to keep that under wraps? Would you believe until May 7th, 2020? What is that? That's 29 months. What happened? Well, the new director of national intelligence told Adam Schiff, you really ought to release that testimony. And if you don't, I will. And so Adam Schiff released that testimony. Whoa! McGovern wrote it right up. What happened? Well, the New York Times sat on it. For, for how long? Well, at this point, for 29 more months. <laughs> All right? So you get in the picture? For four years, you put 29, 29 together. For four years and 10 months, I think it is, Americans have been deprived of knowing that the Russian hacking of the DNC was, was a crock. I don't want to use the word hoax because that's what Trump does. Now, just to make sure that you, you know, I think Trump was the worst president that the United States ever had. And I always say that because my wife insists, insists that I say that. But nevertheless, here it is. This is what happens when you, you have control of things, you keep it secret. And so for four years, what, four years and 10 months or so, 29, 29 months. Now, the New York Times is gonna surpass Adam Schiff's record if we let it go for a few more days and no one will know that the whole business about Russian hacking was a canard. Nor will they know very much about what has come out in court testimony now, namely that this whole Russia Gate thing was conceived in Hillary Clinton's office, that she approved it, and that President Obama was one of the big pushers. He wanted James Clapper, the National Intelligence Director, to put out the stuff about Russian hacking. And he kicked out 45 Russian diplomats at the same time. So, you know, this is consequential stuff. Lies, lies, and lies. And why is it that a lot of my friends think I'm in Putin's pocket? Because they have no access to this information because they read the New York Times and they still think they get all the news that's fit to print. So this is really important, okay? Uh, see if you can, yeah, this is how you get it. Uh, it's executive session, permanent select intelligence committee, US House of Representatives, interview of Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Henry is the last name, interview, Tuesday, December 5th, 2017. So, all I'm saying here is that the media, that's why I said media, that's the real fly in the ointment. And we have to find some way, some clever way. I don't think it's beyond us. I've said this before, but you know, I think the fault may be in ourselves rather than 
in our stores, we have to figure out some way to break through. And maybe this winter is the time. Thanks very much for listening and staying up this late. Uh, I hope I haven't bored anyone. And thank you, Amar. Thanks, Ray. Just a real quick last question. A lot of people are asking, uh, who, like in regards to this Russia-Ukraine conflict, who are you reading and talking to and listening to to get better understanding? Well, you know, I, I followed Russia foreign policy for five decades now. I pretty much know where to look. John Mearsheimer is uh, a man of unparalleled courage. Uh, he blamed uh, he blamed the NATO uh, for this imbroglio uh, many years ago, uh, and I, I read John and I, I read all kinds of people. Uh, Levin, I, 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 you have to read it all to get some balance. Um, Scott Ritter is right on the mark. I admire Scott, and uh, Scott has uh, courage that uh, very few other people have. If you're interested in Iraq, you may recall that Newsweek, a month before the attack on Iraq, Newsweek had a story that said Saddam Hussein's son-in-law, who was in charge of the missile, biological, chemical, and nuclear programs, told the UN, the US, and the Brits, all those weapons had been destroyed. <coughs> How did Scott know that? Scott knew that because he was a UN inspector. Scott knew that because he had the debriefing report. What did he do? He gave it to Newsweek. At the end of February 2003, Scott did that, okay? Newsweek looked at it and said, oh, you mean there are no weapons? Oh, we better check this out. And so they went up to Langley. <laughs> they went up to CIA headquarters and said, well, what about this? And uh, the DC, the the uh, director's spokesperson said, "It's it's it's bull. It's not correct. It's wrong. It's uh, untruthful. Forget about it." And the, the 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 Newsweek folks and the other correspondents that were there said, "Oh, thanks. Oh, we were we were just about to write on this. It appeared." in a little periscope item on the 1st of March, 2003. So Newsweek couldn't be, couldn't be uh, accused of denying it completely, but that's all that happened. Was the evidence good? It was unimpeachable. It was, an, it was a UN document from the DB, debriefing report. I didn't know it was Scott that gave it to them, but he did. He banged on Biden's door. He banged on Hillary's car. He says, look, I know there are no weapons of mass destruction there. Uh, and he didn't get, didn't get uh, to first base. So what I'm saying here is that when you get a guy like Scott Ritter, you read him. When you're a guy like Mearsheimer, you read him. But you also read the crazies. And, you know, I had, <laughs> I had prepared a little uh, clip here, which we don't have time to get into. But I even saw something on Fox News. Uh, somebody showed it to me yesterday, uh, an interview of one of the CIA types who said that, the, that Biden's son, Hunter's laptop, looked like it had all the earmarks of a Russian operation. <laughs> and one of the Fox guys interviewed him and said, but it wasn't. It was real. I mean, you know, I mean, hello. It, it, and the guy said, oh, no. So it's really it's really horrendous. Look it up. It's uh, it's on Fox. Uh, who's this guy? Uh, I forget his name. I don't like him at all. Uh, but uh, somebody said that clip. What's his name? Greg Gutfield. I'll, I'll put the link. In yeah. The got, please do. Yeah. And you'll see uh, see how, how far it's come where. Uh, CIA people, and there were 51 so-called intelligence officials that said, uh, Hunter's, lap, Hunter's black top, that's all the earmarks of an intelligence operation run by the Russians. You know, the press ran with that. Uh, YouTube kicked the New York Post off its, off its <laughs> platform. Now, all kinds of things happened which was really, really exciting. I mean, I mean, exciting. I, 
And I have to confess, this is a true confession from Ray McGovern. I knew that that was really important. I wanted to write on Hunter laptop. And I didn't have the courage of Glenn Greenwald. Why? <laughs> because I didn't want to face the feedback from my family. Why are you trying to help Trump win? <laughs> so, you know, if you're an intelligence analyst, you're not supposed to worry about the consequences. You're supposed to just tell the truth. The consequences are up to other people. And I failed in that instance, and I think it's exceptional interest. Uh, I failed to rise to the occasion. Glenn, of course, did, and he had to leave the, the organization that he actually founded and start his own, his own network or whatever. So Glenn is one of my heroes. Read him as well. And uh, Consortium News and Anti-War are probably the best websites that I could recommend. Um, Amy Goodman used to be good. Uh, she's, she's getting better, but uh, she was unwilling to even, even interview me or anybody else who thought that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, that the Russian hacking was not proven. And it was really left a sour taste in my mouth because uh, you're not supposed to be a Democratic spokesman or a Republican spokesman. And I repeat, uh, I have a long lineage of democratic roots. My father cried when FDR lost. I asked my father, what's the difference between Democrats and Republicans? He said, Democrats care about people like us. No more. They don't. They're all together making a lot of money. Last thing I'll say is they're members of the upper crust, which is defined by my Irish grandmother as a bunch of crumbs held together by a lot of dough. Thank you very much. Yay, thanks, Ray. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ray. Thank you everyone for sticking with us for uh, two hours here now. So on that note, everyone have a, have a great night.